Well, hello, Buffy, and welcome to Langevania Music Festival. (laughs) And so, Buffy, congratulations on the release of the doc, Carry It On. It's a very beautiful documentary that gives a perfect portrait of your life, and it's a snapshot. And as you were watching it, was there any, like, surprises Mm -hmm. or, like, revelations when you were watching it to be like, oh, my gosh, I forgot I did that in life, or I forgot it happened that way? Kind of. I mean, let me go way back to the beginning and say that and I didn't want to make another documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Biographies written about me. <laughs> Not really. Shut up now. <laughs> so so um, then when I talked to White Pine and we figured out who was going to be involved, when I found out that Andrea Warner, who had done a biography of me, was going to be the writer... <laughs> I started saying, yeah, and then our director was Madison Thomas, and I said, yes. So so we started up kind of with with an advantage Mm -hmm. in that uh, Andrea already had written a book about me. And so she and Madison could have um, conversations and decide what was actually going to be in the movie, because I couldn't have decided. Uh, And we all know that we left a whole lot out, Mm -hmm. Uh, but a movie has to be a certain length. And so <laughs> they were making those choices ahead of time so that you didn't walk into, you know, a big old cobwebby mess. They already had it straightened out in their beautiful, smart female heads. <laughs> they um, had done the prep work. They were dealing with uh, both White Pine and Eagle Vision, who are two film companies. White Pine's in Toronto. Eagle Vision is in uh, Winnipeg. And uh, uh, so um, (laughs) in spite of the fact that Andrea had written the book and there had been an earlier documentary done by Joan Prowse in Toronto called um, Buffy St. Maria Multimedia Life. In spite of all that, yes, there were surprises (laughs) and maybe there shouldn't have been, but especially especially from Andrea, uh, who, who knows me, pretty well um I mean we've traveled together and we talked on the phone forever and when she was writing the book uh but she she pointed out some things about for instance she said that my song until it's time for you to go Mm -hmm. I mean the folkies wanted to throw tomatoes at me for that you know they just hated that and the song was too pop she she pointed out she said that in her opinion that was the first feminist anthem (laughs) and that got me to thinking Mm-hmm. And I didn't know she was going to say that. So I didn't find out until I actually saw the movie. Mm-hmm. And I got to thinking about that. And I guess, yeah. And when we discussed it, you know, the times in which I wrote until it's time for you to go. I mean, I had already finished college. So I was a grown up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd seen a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, I wrote this song about being in love with someone. And it's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. that you you find a way to make a space in the lives that you'd planned mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's just common sense to me but looking back on it with hindsight about 50 years Andrea concluded that certain lines like that and um uh yes I'll stay with you until it's time for you to go and it <laughs> doesn't say it doesn't say why you have to go is it someone in the Vietnam War is it you know a military person is it is it somebody who belongs to somebody else is it do you just live too far apart? So Andrea had included that it was a feminist anthem, and I thought that was very kind of her. Yeah. And now when I listen to the song, I think of it in a little bit different way. Yeah. I mean, things are similar, I think, for women all over the world, mm-hmm. but our uniquenesses and our differences are also um, are magnificent, are wonderful. Yeah. But certain things we have in common and some of the things that we have in common until it's time for you to go didn't mention mm-hmm. like that feeling of being stuck yep. <laughs> everybody's looking around with each other <laughs> <laughs> that feeling of being stuck when you know that um something isn't working mm-hmm. you know most of us have been in that position and uh you know there are del- there are delicacies that going that go with being a woman delicacies that we employ in order that we don't get beaten up by somebody who's bigger than we are or um, delicacies just in trying to make the world better 
and not engage in the things that tick us off, you know, mm -hmm. like throwing it back. So I don't know. Then there was another surprise uh, with Andrea. Andrea pointed out that in her opinion, there had been a lot of erasure that mm -hmm. I had been erased. And recently uh, I've had, um, I've had reason to look at rock and roll biographies and other music um, biographies and music collections and, oh yeah, I guess I'm not there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, yeah. you know, these things happen and we understand why they happen. A lot of this has to do with business and the fact that you were not one of the artists that was making money for the guy running the show. And we yeah. can understand that. You know, just being girls, that's kind of the way it is sometimes at other levels. Yeah. And throughout the documentary, like, I, I remember, I recalled a lot of them saying, like, you were such a trailblazer for music in at that time and for who you were. And you were always ahead of the time, whether that was, like, through your music or through your activism or even through, like, the way you use technology to create new music. And you've always been connected to who you are as an Indigenous woman. And so I wonder... Has your culture influenced that creativity to always be like thinking two steps ahead of like, how can I do this and make it a bit different than everyone else's or looking into your mm -hmm. culture for the teachings? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, you guessed right on several points, but that's not all there was. Mm. Because when I, when I arrived in Greenwich Village, I had a degree in Oriental philosophy and a teaching degree, and I thought I was on the way to India to become a saint. <laughs> So when I first arrived in Greenwich Village, I wasn't there to be a singer. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people were. They were there to become music stars. I was there. The only thing that gave me the courage to get on a stage was that I believed in the content of the songs. Mm. I didn't. I wasn't even going to stay there. I thought I'd be there for six months. I never even thought I'd make an album. I certainly yeah. didn't think I'd make more than one. Yeah. Because I knew that what I had to say and what I was willing to say, I mean, I wasn't willing to get on a stage and sing, hang down your head, Tom Dooley, <laughs> in order to get a record contract. <laughs> or I was, I objected when Pete Seeger and a bunch of other guys insisted that I be, that I join them on stage and we all hold hands and sing, this land is your land, this land is my land. You know, yeah. I didn't want to do that. No. So I was walking into a situation in which, Several things about me were not what people were looking for. Mm. But the ideas behind the song, I thought, were valuable for people to have. Universal soldier, right? Mm. No. Okay, maybe the answer's blowing in the wind, but I've been listening. And I, haven't, I, I haven't, I don't know if it is. <laughs> and <laughs> where have all the flowers gone? I don't know. But yeah. I do know that he's the universal soldier and his orders come from far away no more. You know, they come from him and you and me <laughs> and brothers. Can't you see this is not the way we put an end to war. So mm -hmm. I was writing things, including love songs, like until it's time for you to go universal soldier, Codine. Mm -hmm. what? Where did that come yeah. from? I was writing things that were important to me because I had lived them. Mm -hmm. And because I thought they'd be interesting to other people because they were unusual. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like in the, in the case of Codine, I, I was trying to get out a message about something. And when it came to indigenous issues, oh boy. Yeah. See, until it's time for you to go, that's a beautiful pop love song. Anybody would like that, even though the folkies looked down my nose at it because it was so pop. A universal soldier, it's hard to argue with that. The Pineywood Hills, Codine, oh yeah, that's what she can be weird. But when it came to indigenous things, I was singing Now That the Buffalo's Gone in New York City yes. to sophisticated, beautiful, open-hearted New Yorkers who wanted to support the civil rights movement. Mm. Wonderful people. They came down to see me in the Gaslight Cafe and I sang them Now That the Buffalo's Gone, which is about build the building of Kinzua Dam in their own state, in their own neighborhood, and they didn't even know about it. Mm. Kinzua Dam yeah. on the Seneca Reservation for which the United States government unilaterally broke the oldest treaty in congressional archives. It had been made in the time of George Washington. And these New Yorkers heard this song. Yeah. And you know what their reaction was? The little Indian girl must be mistaken. Oh my gosh. So the reason why I bring it up is I know that's happened to you too. It's oh, happened yeah. to all of us. <laughs> A teacher saying, oh, honey, you can't be, oh, no, it didn't, no, that didn't really happen. 
no, you know, that kind of um, sympathetic, you know, arm around the shoulder, real sincere condolences, but you probably, no, it couldn't you have gone that. down that way. Yeah. We all, yeah, we, we've, we've been through that. So, you know, um, the only reason why I was there was because I thought maybe I had something to give mm -hmm. that Bob Dylan hadn't written, <laughs> that, that Joan Baez didn't know about, that Judy Collins wouldn't like. Nobody was going to sing my song, so who was going to sing them? Hello, I'll be here for a few more months, and I'm going to go to India, but I'll leave these songs behind. Yeah. Well, that's not how it worked out. Um, I feel very strong and very good about having given those people at that time um, some new, unique, and different songs and ideas that a lot of people really liked. But it wasn't enough. It never was enough. I um, I really was serious. I I knew what New Yorkers didn't know yeah. about the reservations. And I, I knew about the world, what people on the reservations didn't know. So mm -hmm. I was a, I had a unique set of opportunities. One, I had this platform and these things to say. The other, I had some success and some airplane tickets. Hmm. So I found out quite early that um, this combination of show business and um, wanting to make things better mm -hmm. in, in, in the whole indigenous world, I mean, that wasn't too much. It's Oh, not the whole world. Yes, the whole world, because you know what we have in common? <laughs> One thing. <laughs> yeah. We all got hit by the same hammer and we're all trying to recover. Mm -hmm. And if we work together with the descendants of, you know, settler, you know, settler descendants who, who hate it just as, or think they hate it just as much as we do, mm -hmm. you know, we've got some allies. So I was trying to make sense to people in New York. They mm -hmm. were not getting it at first yeah but i do have to say that some people really did try to help although it wasn't the peter paul and mary shown by his judy Collin kind of folks no it was muhammad ali <laughs> oh he's black oh dick gregory oh he's black oh richie havis oh oh my goodness stevie wonder oh gosh all these black people showing up to help us yeah and we didn't we didn't even have to talk them into it they just plain knew enough to open their ears to somebody who was oppressed and not easy to to hear because we're our our information is uh is scarce and hard to find yeah. we're not in we don't get public headlines we don't show up in um popular magazines and um we certainly didn't pop up in their educational experience in school yeah and there was a quote in the documentary, and I, I think I paused when I heard it because I just had to sit with it for a minute, but it, you said you have to carry the medicine for a long time before you administer it, and music is medicine. And so did you ever feel like, and maybe currently still, that you've held back parts of yourself or held back parts of your music because you felt like maybe the world's not ready to take this in yet, or they're not ready to maybe listen to what I'm having to say? No, I had to learn that. Yeah. You know, like the story about now that the buffalo's gone, people weren't ready for it. Uh, then I was living in Spain. I went and lived in Spain for a while when I was um, between my second and third albums. And that's when I wrote uh, uh, Little Wheel Spin and Spin and uh, My Country Tis of Thy People You're Dying. Mm -hmm. And My Country Tis of Thy People You're Dying, you know, it, it, it was definitely too early. I mean, it wasn't, it took at least 50 years. <laughs> Before people stopped thinking that I was just <laughs> mistaken, <laughs> because it was the first time anybody had used that word genocide in reference to the Native American Holocaust mm -hmm. or the indigenous Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the geography might be different, but what happened to us, the details are very, very similar. You know, even though we're oceans apart as indigenous people, we got got by the same guy. Yeah. Oh, boy. And now everybody's realizing that, you know, that was really a barbaric mm -hmm. time, the 1500s, the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And did you realize, Salami, did you know that, like in, in 1865, that there were more indigenous slaves being exported to the, you know, the slave markets of, you know, the Middle East and Philippines and all over Europe than Africans being imported? I did not know that at the all. The indigenous slave trade was huge. Yeah. 
you guys wake up to a book called The Other Slavery. Mm -hmm. Because this is this, we think that we know a thing or two, but we haven't even started. Mm -hmm. The news isn't good, but to know to know the news mm -hmm. is good. It, it it's good. And sometimes it hurts. And yeah. you shouldn't read too much and not enough to burn out about our horror histories. Yeah. But um we we need to be able to understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, just to deal with it because eventually it's going to come out in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really powerful. And you have worked a lot in education over the years, whether it's like through music or bringing youth, indigenous youth, to be able to receive education and how to get there. Mm -hmm. And how do you see? How do you think? You know, not even just like the industry, but own communities. How can we support? youth who are interested in music how can we encourage them to show up to spaces or even encourage the institutions within our communities to put those youth in the music places or put them on stage and recognize them you know and like <laughs> music is so important for children's development and so how can we be doing better to support youth well in the first place <laughs> buy a whole bunch of instruments yeah <laughs> if you're a parent a teacher or a grandparent or an uncle and aunt whatever you want Buy a bunch of instruments. And I mean, for little kids, don't buy a Martin guitar and put it on the wall where no one could get. No, buy some stupid ukulele made out of plastic and give it to your <laughs> three-year-old. Yeah. You know, that's where music comes from. It comes from three-year-olds. Well, that came, that's where it came from in me. When I was three, I sat down and the piano became my favorite toy. Look, that's the yeah. first thing you need to do. Buy mm -hmm. some, some, um, some toy instruments. Little xylophones, um, you know, little pianos. Um, drums and bongos and because kids will make music on anything because because art and music are natural gifts of the creator you don't learn that in music school in music school you learn how to make money in the music business but they cannot teach you how to be a musician what teaches you how to be a musician is having fun with something when you're when you're a kid or if you can still remain childlike at any age Okay, that's the first thing. So provide the instruments. The second thing, we have to change the paradigm. You know, every year on the Grammys and the Junos and the other music awards show, you know, we celebrate the fact that a bunch of um, people have gotten some money together and they're going to give music to this music school and that music program. The only thing they give money to is that which can be bought and sold. Yeah. Lessons. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I was shunned and shamed in school, be in music class. They didn't let me be in band. They weren't gonna let me be in chorus because you know why? Because I couldn't read European notation. Mm -hmm. In other words, I couldn't decode. Yeah. I couldn't decode. But you know, I had the last laugh <laughs> because I'd go home after school and I'd play anything I heard. I could play fake Tchaikovsky or Frank Sinatra, or I could make up songs that nobody on planet earth had ever heard before. And I was three or four or five or six or seven. And, yeah. and I never took any lessons. My mom took me once when she realized that I could sit down and play anything and stuff nobody had ever heard before. Mm -hmm. She took me to a, um, a piano teacher. <laughs> and he said, don't ever make her take lessons unless she begs for them, which I never did. And it turned out I was dyslexic in music. Oh, okay. Yeah. So here's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. The people who usually just give money to music teachers who will teach a child how to how to um, uh, read music, yeah. I mean, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But look who you neglect. Yeah, I mean, there there isn't such a thing as natural musicians. It's not rare. <laughs> Almost anybody is if you give it a shot. But mm -hmm. schools don't give it a shot. No. Schools make it the enemy. Mm -hmm. When I was in school, that was the enemy. No, they, I, I shouldn't do. I, I, they, they just didn't want me to play without written music. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like saying, you're not an Indian unless, um, unless you're following the Indian Act. It yeah. takes away the reality yeah. of your indigeneity. But it doesn't, see, because you already have that. But it's funny. See, with me, there were two things. There were two things, and they're parallel. From the time that I was as little as I can imagine to... <laughs> It's going to be true tomorrow. There were two things. I was told I couldn't be a musician. Mm -hmm. And I was also told I couldn't be indigenous. I must be mistaken <laughs> because there aren't any more around here. 
Yeah. And that was very, very important mm -hmm. to me. So um, in your local communities, raise some money and just give away these instruments. Don't think of it as money. Give it to everybody. Every kid in town ought to have a bunch of little things that they can play with. Instead, we give them Barbie dolls and tanks and, you know, plastic. <laughs> and so, But I think that we ought to be giving kids some nice paper and some crayons, paints, whatever they like. And if a child does something, you know, give it a little mat and a little frame, put it on the wall, rotate them, make a collection, make a scrapbook, celebrate the arts in your children. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's, that stuff comes, creativity, where does that come from? Yeah. I mean, we're made in the image of the creator. What is it? That's our green light for creativity. Mm -hmm. We not only can be creative, we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to settle for this freaking Victorian government <laughs> template they squash on our communities no yeah. we're supposed to invent new things all the time that's what's wonderful and that's what that's how it used to be indigenous communities <laughs> didn't used to be following the map that governments hand down indigenous communities were al alive and well and growing and changing and evolving every single day mm -hmm. somehow um Somehow, some, somehow, you know, people can really get stuck um, either through their job or through having to make money through somebody else's choices. Or, you know, there are many ways, or sometimes it's your family. Sometimes it's your, maybe you come from a family of bullies, you know, who, you know, maybe there were residential schools in their past and the whole family acts like a bug on pecking order where the guys on top squash the guys under them and down the bottom, you know, here we are all getting squashed. We don't have to do that. That's not life in a circle. It's not indigenous. It's just one of many, 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 many forms of government and societal government it's just one of many and even in the cradle board teaching project for even for grade three kids we were teaching them about three different styles of indigenous government on turtle island we taught them about the haudenosaunee confederacy and about um, one of the test questions was we had taught them about impeachment because you know europe didn't have impeachment that, uh, impeachment it was a a concept that's been introduced through the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. <clears throat> you know, one of the test questions was impeachment. Does it mean this, this, or the third wrong choice was um, you shouldn't put peaches in the leader's food. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> checked that one. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's so good. But yeah, okay. So buy kids instruments. That's going to be my number one task now is just making sure that every kid in St. John's and Newfoundland and beyond has some form of instrument in their hands to make any kind of music because any kind of noise is music. And so that's also something we should be encouraging youth more. Well, if you want to put something together, get back to me. We'll do a little fundraiser together. We'll figure out some kind of way. I'll we'll match figure, somebody we'll something, something or other. Yeah. We'll figure out some, some, <laughs> some kind of something. <laughs> but the other thing that you must do. Yeah. We have to get through to the schools. The schools, I guarantee the school board, the parents and the principals, everybody believes that music can be taught and yeah. therefore they ignore natural musicians. Mm -hmm. Natural musicians ought to be the ones in the front yeah. showing everybody how it ought to sound. And the poor kids, you know, the kids who, who don't, who, who are not in touch with their, their natural musician, you know, they're trying to figure it out. But there's no shame in the natural musician being equal or even ahead, which mm -hmm. we usually are because we know how, we we know it as soon as we hear it. We don't learn through our eyes and linear re, you know reading. We learn through our ears, and it's immediate. Mm -hmm. And of course, nobody you ever heard of is like this. I mean, is it just Buffy? No, it's like people like. Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley and Wes Montgomery and Chet Atkins, you know, Chet Atkins, <clears throat> great, great jazz guitarist, right? <clears throat> yeah. I asked him once, I said, you know, people give me the business sometimes, you know, the, you know, the guys I hire, they'll be mad at me because I can't read music and they can, and I'm the boss and writing the checks and I'll get resentment. He said, you know what I, you know what I say when somebody asks me if I can read music? And I said, no, Chet, what? And he said, not enough to hurt my plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> So that's it. See, music is supposed to be play. Yeah. And schools turn it into decoding European notation and work. And it kills it. 
That's what kills music. Insisting that a child operate from the opposite side of the brain mm. is the same as making a right-handed kid right with their left hand or vice versa, you know? Yep. It's just a mistake that teachers make, but they don't know they're making it. Mm -hmm. So if you can go in with a big smile on your face and find a way to say that in a nice way, then you might be able to get something going in a school. But for right now, I guarantee you, most of the great musicians in, in your young community are being ignored and maybe even repressed. Yeah. No, that's really good to keep in mind. And that that is, I do see a lot of limitations in the schools here, not just music, but mu music is like a main focus where even then if you're bad at an instrument, it's like you don't join band the next year or you're kind of shunned out from feeling like you can rejoin band because it's like, you're not getting it. So <laughs> you should try dodgeball or something, you know, like, so. Uh, <laughs> no, so. you should sit, you should try just sitting around with, with, without all that pressure and just having fun with music. Music's about playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, music for me was what, um, you know, football and hockey and you know soccer were to other kids and I didn't play Barbies either I made art I had fun that's how I had fun yeah. and I didn't do those other things <clears throat> but almost all of the kids um follow um as they are led and nobody's leading them down here and oh boy it's a really fun path so <laughs> maybe you can get something going <laughs> I'll work on it uh <laughs> and finally the title of the documentary carry it on what does that phrase mean to you and how do you see it relating to your music and to your legacy? I, I like the song anyway. I, I really like that song. And yeah. uh, it seems like it's right on for our times right now. But I wrote it maybe 40 years ago. Yeah. Well, you know, as your earlier question, do you ever hold back because yeah. the timing isn't right? You should. Yeah. So it means a lot to me because really it, the song identifies you the individual with community and with nature mm -hmm. and that really is the way it is mm -hmm. i mean modern society might um might think not that's why we're in such trouble yeah but indigenous societies or people who still are living in um you know um more balanced ways mm -hmm. we are connected the individual the community and nature the reality is we're all connected one thing and that's not just poetry i mean everybody's saying it now thank god <laughs> they didn't used to even say it but at yeah. least they're saying it now and it's true we need to be find you know ways to work together to make things better everywhere to, to save ourselves i mean yeah. positivity is possible mm -hmm. but not a lot of people are sticking up for it and, and and we all know why, you know, I mean, business rules and peer pressure hurts, mm -hmm. but there's so many things that we can do together through the arts, even this little conversation. I mean, this is kind of fun. Huh? I, I love mean, it. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, uh, you guys talking to you guys this morning, it's, it's beautiful. And why are we doing it? It has to do with the arts mm -hmm. and with communication and with community love making new friends you know yeah. having a good time and learning something at the same time is is real natural and, and thanks for inviting me by the way <laughs> i wish i were really there oh, i've been for years it's well you have to come to newfoundland sometime sooner oh. i only come when the weather's nice though otherwise it'll be stuck <laughs> in a blizzard or you'll go through eight different seasons in the one day <laughs> but it's an honor to be with you, Buffy, and thank you for always making the time and chatting to us. I know the community, like, will I'll be in the theater watching them with this. So I hopefully they're. I know they're going to be buzzing because they're like, oh my gosh, Buffy's here chatting with us, and it means uh. <laughs> for musicians and any kind of artists or even just community members who aren't in the music industry or they don't play music. Like listening to these conversations are very impactful, and so. I know on like behalf of Lanya Vanya and like the St. John's Women's Film Festival, just thank you so much. Like you've, you're such a light and it's always such, always a pleasure to have a conversation with you and everyone needs to watch the documentary, Carry It On. It made me laugh. It made me cry. It made me <laughs> dance. It made me sing. <laughs> so it's, it's a truly a beautiful piece of work. Oh, thank you. I will pass on your compliments to all the people who, who actually did it. <laughs> I just sat there and they took my picture, but thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you guys have a great time and I hope you enjoy the movie.